morning, everyone. I hope everybody had their first cup of barista-style coffee. So everybody's up and running. So yeah, still sleepy at the moment, I guess. Anyway, so I'm Aftab Siddiqui. I'll be moderating this session. It's a, a more of a early morning session in many ways. So we'll be talking about the uh, iPhone 8 and iPhone X launch today. So if you haven't seen the launch last night, uh, we'll be covering it in details here. So you won't miss anything and probably will give you a pre-order as well. So if your colleagues are outside, just uh, message them so that they, they can be here as early as possible because we'll be closing the gates as soon as we hear the last bell. So starting from the first panelist, uh, we have uh, one of the largest telco provider in Australia, Telstra. Uh, so Sunny Young will be discussing the IPv6 trial or deployment uh, status um, from Telstra. So to be back on track, uh, this is a network operations track, nothing to do with Apple or iPhone 6 or iPhone 8 or X. Um, we'll be discussing IPv6 only. So let's start from Sunny Young, um, please. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining such uh, early uh, in the day. Um, so I'm from I'm Sunny, and I'm from Telstra in Australia. Um, today is a bit of an update on our rollout on IPv6, but I want to actually talk about uh, more of a topic on something that hasn't really been discussed so much uh, at the moment in many forums. Um, and I want to just pose some questions, basically, to everyone in a group and uh, see where we go from there, basically. So, a um, bit of introduction about myself. So I've been uh, attending APNIC for about uh, four or five years now and working on IPv6 deployments in wireless. Uh, and uh, we have actually launched a dual stack uh, already in Telstra on the wireless network. Uh, and we've got uh, quite a number of customers actually uh, running uh, dual stack on their uh, uh, UEs. Um, and uh, we're planning to do a single stack launch sometime uh, this before the end of this year and hopefully we can announce that very shortly. So I've been leading the uh, IPv6 deployments in Telstra uh, and uh, more to uh, more recent developments, I've actually been working on uh, the Telco cloud deployments uh, in Telstra as well very recently in the mobile space. And I want to just uh, share some ideas and some issues that we've been having um, uh, that is pretty common to almost everyone in the industry, I believe. Um, and uh, let's see where we go from there. So uh, we have to do an executive summary because we're from a big corporation. Um, and uh, basically, we'll talk about uh, what an IPv6 mobile network looks like just very, very briefly. Uh, where are we with the deployment um, and the challenges that lie ahead? Uh, and what else we need to consider for v6? So um, I'm not going to dive into too much detail here because it's a very detailed tutorial that Geordie is going to be running tomorrow morning. Bit of advertisement for you. <laughs> um, so we need to do IPv6 on a mobile network. We've been doing NAT translations since forever. And as the address is depletes, it's going to become more expensive to extend IPv4. Um, dual stack's effective uh, temporarily, um, but it doesn't actually solve any issues uh, with your depletion issues. Uh, depletion problems. So you need to actually do something a bit more drastic and do single stack. So uh, introducing V6, what does it do? Uh, reduces your dependency on that, removes the need to do any sort of regionalization. If you really need to do it, that's okay. I mean, a lot of carriers are doing regionalization anyway, but you actually remove the requirement to actually do that if you do V6. Uh, and it pushes applications uh, to move to V6 as well. It's a chicken and egg scenario there. And well, you've got to choose the chicken or the egg. 
Um, so I choose the chicken and I'll do the network first. That's basically what I'm trying to do. So uh, very quickly, uh, we've got the uh, radio network, we've got our user, um, and then we've got uh, uh, a radio gateway elements uh, in 4G, that's an EPG. Going through a carrier network, that's going to be dual stack. The radio is just V4 transport, don't need to do anything there. Dual stack in between, some sort of border router, do some natting, we all love natting. Uh, IPv6 goes natively into V6 public, IPv4 will just do a NAT64 translation there. Obviously there's going to be some issues with the NAT translations, but uh, this is not what this topic's about. But uh, that's approximately how an IPv6 flow would work for, uh, for our telco. Okay. Uh, so let's have a look at the APNs. So basically we have two APNs. We have a single stack APN, uh, which is actually dual stack because we've got to support our end users that are on legacy handsets. But we enable DNS64 specifically for that APN. And handsets that need 464X like would simply run on that particular APN. Uh, they would use a combination of DNS64 and NAT64 to do the translation mechanism on the internet. Uh, obviously, it doesn't also solve your tethering problem. You actually need a tethering APN as well. The tethering APN doesn't need a single stack. It can be dual stack. Because you don't know what's actually attached on the other end. It's a problem that might be solved with DHCP prefix delegation in the future, but it's not actually available in, uh, from all vendors at the moment. It's going to be a lot of discussions that need to happen before we can get DHCP PD uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, all, all uh, APNs. <coughs> so, uh, and, and into all vendor equipment that can support it. So we need to actually look at that with our vendors. Um, but at the moment, very viable solution here. This just establishes two bearers. So if you have a tethering APN, at least you can establish a second bearer um, to do your tethering. Now on top of that, obviously you need a third one uh, for IMS, but um, that's a different topic altogether by itself. So realistically, we're looking at a 464X LAT plus NAT64 plus DNS64 combination for your handset, and then just enable IPv6 or DNS on all your APNs, and specifically DNS64 on your uh, on the APN that's used for specifically for your applications only, not your tethering one. Okay, so uh, not specific to Telstra. In Telstra, as I mentioned, we've launched dual stack already. We have some users on there already. We're getting operational experience. We're going to do single stack very soon. But as a whole, most content providers are already providing V6 reachability, your Facebooks, your Googles, and uh, the majority of your users would probably be already going to V6, do, going to those destinations using the V6 addresses uh, natively without any sort of translations. Also, dependence on your content providers um, your, uh, and, your inter, uh, and your IX providers, of course, but for all, all intentions and purposes, it's primarily on native V6. So if you've got dual stack, it's probably going to be using V6. Some providers have uh, also mandated V6 app support uh, in their app stores already. A particular fruit company is already doing that. Um, so all of the new apps are actually supporting IPv6, um, or should be, uh, today. Um, networks are also evolving to support new V6 connections. Uh, most carriers are doing either single stack or dual stack. There's particular large carriers in in Korea, that's already using single stack. In the States, that's using single stack. So it's not, some, it's not something new. They've done it for years, um, at least two or three years. So it's not something new. And uh, the majority of devices that are currently being released, they're all supporting IPv6 natively already. So your 464X LAT's already available in Android, all right? And uh, your Microsoft uh, is, uh, well, it's not really there anymore, um, but uh, the, the, the devices are still out there. They can do dual stack. Um, and then you've got your fruit company ones, which are actually being deployed with single stack in some carriers already. <clears throat> so, uh, from Google, that's where we're at at the moment. So it's just gone up and up and up. Um, in Telstra, our graph actually looks very similar to this from our uh, SIOs as well. So uh, just going up uh, uh, exponentially at the moment. And uh, as we get more users onto single stack, we expect our user base to go more exponentially, uh, significantly over time. Uh, when we do launch, uh, we expect the graph internally uh, for our SIOs to actually be much steeper. But uh, this is where we're at as a, as a whole group. So 
well done to every one of you. <laughs> we're, we're up to here uh, from Google's perspective. So we've done from a mobile environment what we wanted to do. We're starting to get our handsets together. We're starting to get our network together. We're starting to deploy IPv6. We're starting to see traffic. Right? On our fixed side, we're starting to see IPv6 being deployed. We're getting CPEs that support dual stack already. Um, so what is there left to do? We've pretty much done everything. It's a lot of complexity uh, that we haven't resolved yet. If you're a telco, you probably have value-added services. So things like firewalls, video optimizers, parental control. All right, just three examples on the board here. From your, uh, from your PGW, uh, which is your radio gateway, going to, the board, going to the border router, sorry. All right, going to your border router, um, you might have a direct connection to the internet. But uh, customers may want to go to a firewall service only and then go to the internet. They may go want to do both firewalls and video optimizers and then go to the internet. They may want to do all three. They may want to do different variations of these, depending on their subscription, depending on what they want to do. How do we do that today? If you don't have a traffic optimization platform, um, you may have to use policy-based routing. That's pretty much your only solution. And what that does is introduce more complexity in your network. So this is not a pure IPv6 problem. This is a, this is a complexity problem in your network. So, there's this really big push at the moment to virtualize everything. So you can virtualize some of these functions. They don't necessarily need to be on a server sitting in, you know, sitting in a bare metal box. It could be in a cloud platform that's sitting in your network. So that's what this slide is about. Move forward a bit. Network function virtualization. So this is not necessarily about virtualizing your firewalls and your routers and your switches. It's functions that your users are using in your network, like your, well, if you're game enough, the virtual PGW, your radio gateway, you can virtualize that. Uh, it's a very uh, tricky thing to do, but you can do it. You can virtualize the entire gateway uh, behind, uh, inside a cloud environment. You can virtualize your firewalls, your video optimizers, your parental control, your CG NAT even, all right, and pass all your traffic into this cloud environment. But what does that do? That just shifts your complexity of your network into the cloud. So virtualization may reduce your cost, but it doesn't necessarily reduce the complexity. And each of these paths still require VPNs or policy-based routing. So you don't actually, if you don't have a traffic optimization platform, you're still encountering the same problems. What do you do? You can virtualize your traffic optimization platform, but yeah, you still got to pass your traffic through the virtual traffic optimizer. So the problem is still there. It's just becoming more and more convoluted. SDN is another term that's been thrown around. So SDN uh, it means a lot of different things. So from, but from my perspective, I'm looking at it from one thing only, and that's service function chaining. Service function chaining is pretty much the equivalent of policy-based routing in SDN. So what do you want to do here? You want to identify the user and then you want to allocate a particular service chain to the user according to their subscription. So as an example, service A uh, goes to the firewall, the CGNAT, and then the internet. Service B will be someone that wants a firewall function, a parental control, and then CGNAT, and then the internet. So what you do is you categorize the subscriber to a particular flow, and then push that subscriber through that flow in the network, and ensure that the network is programmed in a way to understand what that subscriber is trying to do, and then push them through the, through the network using SDN. And to do that, you need something uh, that's called service function chaining, and it requires something uh, using network service headers. And uh, I don't remember the RFC. It's actually in notes. It's not coming up here. But uh, come up to me later, and I can share the RFC number with you. Um, but yeah, you need to do something with NSH and service function chaining in order to simplify this and automate it. Let's go even deeper. So assuming that your cloud is actually using OpenStack, because that's at the moment what the industry is heading towards at the moment is an OpenStack environment. But uh, the IP fabric as part of all that 
is part of, uh, you have to do an underlay and overlay uh, sort of setup in order to create VXLAN tunnels. So your underlay at the moment with VXLAN currently only supports IPv4. But the question is, why does it need to be v4 only? You can reuse the IPv4 address space everywhere in all of your clouds. It's actually fairly simple. Right? You don't actually need IPv6. You can just redeploy your IPv4 addresses across all of your clouds in all of your re different regions. But why are we stuck on IPv4? Why can't we move to IPv6? You can do point to point 127s instead of uh, slash 31s uh, between all your links and get a, do away with IPv4 altogether. Why, why aren't we pushing this? The other thing is, if you look at the problem that we had before with service chaining, is VXLAN over EVPN really the best solution for a telco cloud? It's fantastic for enterprises, right? But for a telco environment, the requirements are very different. So how do you take care of service chaining with VXLAN over EVPN? Um, the other thing is, if you look at the underlay configuration, there's lots of different options. You can use OSPF, you can use BGP, some options, you can use MPLS even, um, but everything theoretically should be contained in a single AS. If you use eBGP, it's not going to happen, given it is in the underlay, but really on the overlay it should be all one AS, right? But what routing protocol are you going to use between the VTEPs? Uh, that's something that is very open to interpretation. But uh, that's something that hasn't really been unified. Uh, if you're looking at a common NFV environment across all your different domains within your space, because uh, everyone will have different requirements in different domains within your carrier environment. You can have an IT team uh, that needs a different requirement uh, compared to your wireless team, compared to uh, your management team, um, uh, network management team that requires different functions. The other thing is, if the whole thing is running IPv6, if we can get it all running IPv6, why not leverage segment routing? Is that even possible? Don't know. Is that something we can look at in, say, five years? Probably, probably not now, but maybe in five years. OpenStack is somewhat ready for IPv6. It's not entirely ready. Neutron does support v6 subnets and DHCP v6, as well as Slack. So it has all the functions in there. You can onboard it today, but it appears that you can only do dual stack at the moment. It doesn't actually support single stack IPv6. Um, so really, there's only two options when you do open stack uh, deployments. It's uh, dual stack everything or conditional dual stack. So everything, basically, you can have single stack IPv6 deployments somewhat, but realistic, if you want it operational, needs to be dual stack. There's even more. Uh, it doesn't actually really support external IPAMs, your IP management systems for IPv6 to allocate IPv6 subnets. So there's an IPAM issue. The OVS tunnel types, they don't support v6 until 2.6.0. So you really got to check your OVS version numbers, your open vSwitch. Your single stack v6 tenant networking, as I said, is not fully available. Your VPN support's not very good until at least the Kilo version. We're up to uh, we're up to much further away from Kilo now, but you know if you're still running Kilo, then you've got VPN issues for v6. And of course, our favourite topic. There's actually a NAT translation on the uh, OVS and the Linux bridge. So uh, to go from your your uh, your instance through the OVS into the, uh, into the Linux bridge and into your external interface, there's actually a NAT translation occurring. And that's on IPv4. So for v6, it doesn't, it doesn't really exist there, but God, there's a NAT there. You know, why are we doing NAT there for, for, for cloud? It's, it's a little bit silly. So there are some issues. Now, moving away from the cloud, I'm going to move further out and see where else do we really need to look at to do IPv6 as well. So there's a term on here called FOG. It's not really shared that much around the industry yet, but I see FOG as mobile edge computing. It's basically for 5G, and 5G requires super low latency. 
And depending on the network slice, as in, is it going to be for an automated factory, automated cars, uh, and the application behind it, the requirements are very different for 5G. At some point, we need to move even closer to the user. So the telco cloud, what does it actually is? Is a service functions in the form of VNFs that are onboarded onto the cloud, virtualized packet core nodes, depending on if you use, want to use CUPS or not, uh, control plane user plane separation, where you can move the control plane so that it's more centralized and the user plane more closer to the user, possibly putting media caches much closer to the user, as in literally right next to the base station, and all your other value-added services, like your virtual firewalls, your parental controls, right next to the user. And then you just push your internet connection directly connecting into your radio tower. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when? Oh, geez, we don't know. <laughs> Depending on whenever 5G gets ratified. Um, so uh, if you look in this diagram here, that's basically what we've got. We've got a roaming gateway connecting to a PE that's connecting to an MPLS core. Your MPLS core will connect uh, to all of your other environments uh, in your network. Your border router going to the internet, right? Your CRAN, your cloud RAN, basically you can virtualize your entire uh, RAN uh, uh, radio stack as well. And then your telco cloud, which encompasses all of your packet core as well. Why aren't we doing single stack V6 for transport? 6PE. We're doing MPLS already. Yes, it's V4, but why aren't we doing 6PE? Oh, it would solve a lot of problems with my IP addressing scheme for transport. It really would. But why aren't we doing it? Do we want to use segment routing for that instead as well, instead of traditional MPLS? Is that going to simplify things? Possibly. Is that being looked at? Why is everyone still stuck on IPv4 for transport? We still need 6PE, 6VPE. 6VPE is just sitting on top of that. We're using that already today, right? Um, that's just to ensure our VPNs are supported. You've still got your traffic going. Uh, and we've deployed that already today. But it, it's really the 6PE component that I'm asking the question here. We still seem to, seem to be stuck on IPv4. Why, why don't we get rid of it? It'll simplify your addressing scheme. So, yep. So what's our goal, really? So I've shared some topics very quick. Um, and realistically, this is really hard, the first one. I want to remove all IPv4 private addressing in my network. I really want to. The public addressing part's a little bit harder because we still need to do NAT translations. All right? We've still got IPv4 addresses that we need to, uh, IPv4 destinations that we want to get to. But uh, I want to try and remove as many IPv4 addresses as possible. And then that means that we can do NAT translations for only what is necessary. Eventually, that will mean IPv4 running as a service. So we just run IPv6 everywhere. And if you need IPv4, it's just provided to you as a service instead. That's pretty much it. Uh, so there's still a long journey. This is just the start. We've done some launches for our customers, but there's still a long way to go. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Um, and I totally agree um, on the VXLAN part. Uh, in the RFC, they did mention the um, IPv6 that it should support IPv6. It's just a vendor who's not doing it. I'm not sure if there's any vendor in the room who can answer that. But anyway, so they said, okay, fine, it's easy to do it with V4, let's go with it. Yeah, anyway. So um, moving forward, so I am taking orders for a T-shirt which will say, what keeps the world together, gravity, and what keeps the internet together, NAT. If you heard this famous quote yesterday, so let's hear from the man itself today what he's talking about um, during the IPv6 measurements. Jeff Houston, thank you.
Hi, uh, Jeff Houston again. I kind of think that Sunny has a problem. And I think most of you network operators have pretty much the same problem. And the problem is that folk like Google, Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn have created a new industry about gathering data about you. We all know this, that's nothing new. But they don't share anymore. So when we're running Facebook and it collects your profile, the last thing they want to do is share that information with the platform or the network. Increasingly, applications are becoming paranoid. And increasingly, they actually are trying to hide themselves from other applications running on the same platform, from the network, even from law enforcement. So when you find protocols like Quick out of Google, where the visible wrapper is just UDP, nothing more, and everything else, flow control, all the TCP controls, because there's TCP there, but it's hidden one layer below, below the encryption point, where you can't see. So when you ask Sonny, and maybe you shouldn't, because it's a rude kind of question, how many devices run V6 on his network? I'm pretty sure he can't answer. And I'm pretty sure none of you can answer, because the network doesn't really have a good insight into what users do anymore and the problem is getting worse not better because both the users and the applications they run don't like daylight. They want to hide themselves from each other, from the platform and from the network. We're seeing the DNS go encrypted. We're seeing transport go encrypted. We're seeing increasingly, why is the Facebook app so humongous? Because it uses its own TCP drivers. It doesn't use the ones from Android or Apple. Why? Because they can. So this brings this really interesting issue about feedback. Because while Sonny's doing a great job, is he doing it in a data vacuum? How does he know what's going on? How do you know what's going on? So into that, we gaily strolled, going, we think we have a different way of doing this that might be helpful. Because, like it or not, you're trying to engineer based on data. Reliable, unbiased, and I would even claim open measurements. They're tough to find, but they're really valuable when they happen. How much of the world's traffic is UDP? I don't know. Should we know? Oh, yes, we should know. How do we know? Well, that's really hard. Because increasingly, these kinds of measurements just don't exist anymore. And there are a number of ways to do it. And our sister regional internet registry over in Europe, RIPE, has, has built upon work that was earlier pioneered uh, in Planet Labs and also at a number of US research institutes, uh, Archipelago from CADA and a few others, where you scatter highly capable devices through the network and use that. You can program them. In Atlas's case, if someone got an Atlas probe with them, they are tiny, you know, just the size of an ether jack, really. Uh, they've got a full-blown Linux stack inside it. You can program them up. There aren't very many of them. And in the scale of global measurement, 10,000 is not a lot. It's a little. And so what you get is a small number of highly agile measurement agents that tend to be housed in geeks' houses. So you've got a bit of a geek bias when you do this kind of stuff. Um, we decided to go completely the opposite way and basically up the volume, uh, an extremely large number of pretty inflexible measurements to try and see more but be able to program less. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we enlist literally hundreds of millions of measurement endpoints. Uh, and you don't even know. I'm like, we just, we just co-opt you. Um, and we do a few tens of millions of measurements every single day. And every single day we enrol new ones. Um, and we do, in these measurements, absolutely the same thing that all of you do. 
Because if you really come down to it, what you do is you fetch URLs. So you ask the DNS, what's the IP address of this service where that URL is? And then you go fetch it. Bit of DNS, bit of TCP. And that's what you do. And that's what we measure. So we try and measure very consistently exactly what users do all the time. Now, the way we do this is, of course, obvious. Well, I hope it's obvious. <laughs> Um, the one thing that everyone has on their screens, no matter where they are, who they are, or you know, whatever they're doing, is ads. Um, it's what makes Google 97% of its not inconsiderable revenue and certainly fuels a huge amount of this industry, including you know, all those free services which are ad-funded. So ads are ubiquitous. The human use internet is just dense with ads. And it's not just pictures. Pictures are so, so, so last century. Um, all these ads have script elements because to get you to click on it, they'll do anything. And most of it relies on some kind of active scripting. Now, the scripts won't do everything. But on the other hand, you've got to get that DNS answer from somewhere. You've got to get that web object from somewhere. And in the ad, what we make sure is that when you start talking the DNS, you're talking to us. No one else, us, our servers. And when you get that web object, you're talking to us, our web servers. We can control it. We can control their behaviour and we can measure it like crazy. So I want to go into a little bit of, of sort of design of this because I do get a lot of questions about it and I thought, well, if we explain it here and explain it once, you'll all understand and then you won't need to ask us questions, right? So <laughs> we'll talk about the kind of five tasks here, the ad placement algorithms, uh, the way we do the scripting, uh, the way we set up the tasks, how we process the results and the end up processing and how we deal with it. There's a lot of work going on here. This is about seven, eight, nine years of work actually. So I'm going to whiz through it all in a few minutes because it was all easy, right? Um, we use Google. Uh, we could use other ad networks, but Google is remarkably good at doing ads. That's their business. Like I said, Android, lots of Android phones, doesn't make the company any profit at all. Lots of Gmail doesn't make the company any profit at all. Most of what they do doesn't make the company any profit at all. What makes the company profits is ads. So we do ads because Google are very good at that. Um, Google's ad system is, I think, beyond human intelligence. Uh, in behind this is a whole bunch of AI scripts that are designed to take all the advertisers' money out of their pocket as efficiently as possible, leaving none on the table. So if you say to Google, I've got 100 bucks, Google say, thank you very much, I'll spend it for you. If you say to Google, I've got 10 cents, it's still, thank you very much, I will spend that for you too. And so we actually had to understand the way it works. And the way it works is everything works in Google on a 24-hour cycle. But the way it does it is that it starts to learn how to place your ad to maximise your ad's distribution and Google's revenue. So when you first place an ad, it looks like that red bit over there. Am I? Oh, there it is. Whoops, sorry. The, the first time it says, well, I don't know who's going to do it, so tell you what, I will turn your ad on everywhere for about a minute. And all of a sudden you get 20 million impressions, your server melts, and Google goes, well, I've got your money, we'll wait for another 24 hours. That's a too big a rate. The next day they calm down a bit and then the following day and then the following day. So after a while, Google get to learn how to place your ad. Now interestingly, when you ask for an ad, it doesn't run for 24 hours. It runs for around 20 hours just in case they got it wrong. They've got another four hours if there's any money left on the table because they hate leaving money on the table. So generally what it happens is on a 24-hour cycle, you get about 20 hours of ads and then four hours of nothing, um, which is fine, but what if that four hours of nothing is in the United States or in Australia or in some company you want to measure and it's their evening? You won't see them. So what we do is run 12 ads and tell Google we're in 12 different time zones simultaneously. And so the way this works is that we then start to gang things up and we overlay the ads so that there's always somewhere where there's an ad running at peak rate. This gives a sort of 24-hour saturation across the ad system, which seems to work quite well. Um, 
we ask for all keywords. We have no preference. We're just the ultimate customer. We're not picky. Um, we go for desktop, mobiles and tablet presentations because that's what you guys use. That's where we want. These are solely image-based AdWords. Uh, they're, they're basically very generic keywords. And it doesn't need a click. Don't click on them. The ad always runs, and if you click, we get to pay more. Um, so, you know, <laughs> just watch it. It's very pretty. It does nothing. Uh, just leave it alone, and we're all happy. Um, so this is the reality of what we do. It's still very patchy across 24 hours. The ad placement rate is around 20 to, to 30 ads per second aggregate every single second of the day across each of our servers. So that way we get a relatively uniform set of campaigns. So this ad is running 10 million impressions a day. What's the next step? Um, every time we change the measurement, we needed to set up a new ad campaign, and this got annoying. And we thought, you know, we can do this with computers. So the way we actually do it now is that the ad is a generic bucket. It doesn't actually have the tests. And when the ad appears on your screen, the first thing it does is go back to our server and say, what should I do? That way we can change the tasks without changing the ad. This is really quite cool. So you can get an ad up inside of half a day if we really wanted to. So when the ad is loaded up, it comes to say and says, what should I do? The ad script then comes along and says, well, you should do this list. And it then goes off and does it. Um, what we actually do a little bit more, because we've noticed that you know the world is quite big and it takes a long time to get from here to, ooh, say, you know, Patagonia. Uh, we actually run four servers at this point, uh, North America, South America, Europe and Asia, and we locate the customer based on their IP address and go, well, I'm going to send all your ads if you're in Taiwan to Singapore. So you will be interacting with our node in Singapore. If you're in North America, you're probably going to Dallas and so on. We control that, not the ad, because we geolocate the user and then send them to where they're going. What does it look like? That's what it looks like. Oddly enough, those are just seven really standard URLs. Absolutely standard specification, you know, HTTP. To be perfectly frank, it's HTTPS because that's what Google wants, but I used HTTP because that's what I just screen grabbed at the time. The DNS name is heavily encoded. In fact, the DNS name could actually be regarded as a mini program in microcode because the name causes the DNS server to do things. So the name you use is actually heavily encoded. And then the arguments to HTTP are also heavily encoded. How does it happen? Standard HTTPS GET request. We actually give every user a unique, a unique identifier. So we know you. In this case, the user is F367F08C, never to be repeated. So everyone gets a unique key all the time. So we can set users apart and understand that group of ads because they share a common ID. Um, each task is a URL, as I said. Um, the domain component exercises the DNS, and it has this task name, a unique identifier. We also include where we think you are, your country code. And then we started to get really sort of interested in time. So it encodes the time when it happened. And so what you see there, if you break it down, there are a number of different tests. Um, DNSSEC, ECDSA, V6, a unique ID, the country where we think you're living in because of your IP address, the time of day when we gave out this experiment, uh, and what we think your user ID is. We, we assign basically an encoded version of the IP address so we can match four and match six together. Always handy. Um, so what happens? Two things. You ask the DNS to resolve the name, and if you get back an answer, you then ask for the web object. Simple as that. Because the name is unique, it's not cached. Because it's not cached, we get to see every single query. That's important. Because that allows us to play with the answer, and we do. Um, the other thing is, too, you can never assume that browsers are sane. Browsers are insane. So if you say do A, B, and C, 
it will just as likely do CBA or any other permutation. So the order in which we do things, or at least give you things, and the order in which your browser does things, nah, entirely irrelevant, you know, it's just random. Um, we have some tasks and controls for others. As I said, order is not dependent. So what do we test? Um, we've done a huge amount in V6, and, and the kind of tests is, is a very simple. Here is a web object that you can only get to if you have V6. If you don't have V6, you can't get it. Um, here's one that's dual stack. Which protocol did you use? V4 or 6? And here's one that's V4 only. Are you using one of Sunny's V6 only services? How did you get to this V4 only service? Uh, did you, you know, what did you use? Uh, this was fine until someone came along and said, can you measure DNSSEC? And we thought, yeah, we can. Because we can selectively sign and not sign the DNS. And we can give you both objects. And we can even give you one that's signed badly. Just to see how you handle badly signed objects. Um, we can change the size of the packets in the DNS. We can change the size of the packets in the web. We can add extension headers gratuitously just to show how lousy your networks are in handling V6 packets that contain extension headers. And we can measure the outcomes. And just because we're interested in QUIC, we're mucking around too to find out who will respond to QUIC, because you can. Uh, and all of those things are possible here. Um, there are two ways of actually understanding what happened. We're measuring you, but we also get the user to measure themselves. Because some of these things rely on the user not doing something. So when you don't fetch an invalidly signed DNS object, is it because you just got bored and went to the next pictures of cats? Or is it that you really tried and you're validating and you don't like you know, badly signed objects? So we add this result line to make sure that you kind of garbage clean after us to figure out if you get to the result line, you completed all the tasks to the extent you could. You didn't get bored. You didn't abandon the ad. You ran it for, in our case, 10 seconds. Whatever's happening happened in 10 seconds. So I just said that. Results are there to catch up the things that didn't happen because that's the cleanest way to do that. On our side, it's relatively standard. We run Nginx as, as the web server and the standard log. Nothing special about that. We used to run bind. We don't run bind anymore. We run a massively customized DNS server because we've actually managed to make the DNS name a mini program and get the DNS server to customize answers based on what you ask for. And just for the hell of it, we capture every single packet in and out because, you know, they're computers. We can do that. Um, so, interestingly, a lot of folk, including you, are spied on by all kinds of other things. And sometimes it happens really quickly. Sometimes it takes forever. There are folk who pick up DNS logs and just ask them again. Thank you, Bluecoat. Thank you, Nominum. Thank you, a whole bunch of people who basically harvest the DNS and think, well, that's good. Let's ask the question again. There's a whole bunch of folk who do the same thing for URLs. They ask again. They pick up what you're doing and replay it just to see. Um, this confuses our measurement system a lot, which is why we have the time. So basically, we expect when we give you a task, you get back to us within a couple of seconds, and the first thing to come back we take as reality. Everything else, and there are a lot of others, about 30% of the stuff is echoes. We regard as folk looking over your shoulder for various reasons, and we don't measure them. Well, we do, but that's more about looking at folk who are looking at you as distinct from raw data. Um, the echo queries are interesting. Um, Everything should be seen once and only once. Again, that's not the case. There are duplicates. We try and ignore those. Um, we don't take... Um, sorry, if the client says they fetch something, we believe it because of middleware. There are a number of countries... Yeah, I suppose I'll call them that. They are operating at a national level where the way the country um, content rules work is that they trap not the DNS, not even the web get, they trap the answer. So I think I delivered something 
And the user says, no, nah, didn't see a thing. The middleware didn't let me have it. So always we believe the client, not the server, because sometimes the server thinks it happened and the client says, didn't get it. Something in the middle just stopped it, middleware. Oddly enough, though, we believe our own clock. We don't believe your clock because your clocks are screwed. Um, you just don't know what time is. I'm sorry, you just don't. Um, so we run NTP and we believe our, our clock. Um, and as I said, the unique ID allows all this to stitch it up together. We use BGP to locate you as much as we can. Um, and then some little sort of quibbles. We're trying to talk about all of the internet and that means we have a problem. That Google measurement that Sonny showed is not the internet, it's the internet as Google sees it. Google is not big in China. And the V6 penetration in China is not part of Google's measurement to the extent that Chinese users are part of the internet. Their numbers are wrong if you're talking about all the internet. They're Google's numbers, but they're not the internet's numbers. We really wanted to find the internet's numbers. But the problem is the ad presentations are equally skewed. They're all over the place. If you live in India, you're much more likely to see our ad than if you live in America, for example. And that's just one example. The ad network skews stuff differently. So we do a huge amount of work to try and rebalance that out. So we assume, because we've got no better data, that within a country the ads are uniformly distributed. Probably wrong, but I've got no way of correcting that. But we, assume, we know that across countries the ad presentation rate is wrong, so we try and fix that up and rebias it so the weight of China's data is equal to the proportion of Chinese users in the global internet. The weight of Taiwan's data is proportional to the number of Taiwanese users against the global whole, and so on. So we do a fair bit of weighting to, to try and get all of internet numbers. What do we use? The lies governments tell the ITU. Why do we use the lies that governments tell the ITU? We've got no better data. Operators won't tell me their user populations. They seem to some commercial secret. Fair enough, but you have to use what you have. And what we have is ITU stats. So we go and do data mining on populations, on GDP and internet users to get those relativities. We re-rate our numbers. Oh, we're in an IPv6 session, aren't we? So we measure IPv6. The first three tests are IPv6 tests, dual stack, v4 only, v6 only. Yep. So we look at the number who are able to retrieve that six only object and the number of v4 only object and what choice they make. This gives us two metrics and they're subtly different. Sometimes you can see both four and six but you prefer four. So we call you v4, v6, sorry, we call you v6 capable. Capable means when you got a v6 only object, you got it. When there was no choice, you got it, you're capable. Preferred is subtly different. Preferred is your happy eyeballs at work. It says, when I offer you dual stack, you preferred to use V6, which is a slightly lower number than capable and normally should be about the same. In some cases, it's not. We go deeper. Remember I said we captured packets? We capture packets. Now, there's a huge amount of information in the packet capture. And one of the first pieces of information which is really reliable is that every single web fetch is a TCP handshake at the kernel level. I'll say that again, at the kernel level. Why am I saying that? Because it doesn't have the distortion of user level interrupts in your stack. This is low so that whenever that handshake occurs, the responses are rapid and that the platform is not adding to the delay. So when I look at the amount of time between receiving the initial TCP SYN and the following TCP ACK, because I send back a SYN ACK, the time for that handshake is really close to your round trip time. Now let's say your dual stack, I gave you V4 only, I gave you V6 only, I've got two measurements. I'm the same point, you're the same point, 
they should be the same, right? No. A lot of the times they're not. And the only thing that's different is the network and the network path. And so I'm keenly interested, and you should be too, about those differences, those two RTT values. So we track that. Uh, here's Telstra. This is tracking for Telstra over the last, geez, year and a half, two years, the difference between V4 and V6 over that long for their dual stack clients. Up here, V4 was faster. Down here, V6 is faster. I'm measuring from Singapore. And what this means when V4 was faster is that the V6 path from their customers to Singapore went a longer path than the V4 route. Routing changed for them. They noticed they seemed to fix it in December, around Christmas. Over here in March, their V4 path went weird. And V6 was really, really quicker, 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is a bit of a giveaway. The V4 stuff was bouncing across the Pacific. Betcha. Um, so there's a lot to be learned. Just lately, in the last few days, there's another problem, around 50 milliseconds large. We have the same data for every major AS. Why? Because the ad is everywhere. And it gives you these kinds of relatively deep insights into your engineering performance of four versus six by doing a simple measurement over large numbers of users, which can be really helpful if you're trying to engineer Telstra's network and trying to understand why some product manager saying V6 sucks, make it go faster. You can either go, you're wrong, it's really good, or yes, you're right, I better look. Um, we also look at robustness. How many connection attempts succeed? And it's kind of a strange question because doesn't the internet work all the time? Well, oddly enough, it doesn't. And in V4, there's an error rate of around 0.05%, we notice, where we give out the ad and V4 sort of has a hiccup. It doesn't quite work. And you go, well, how do I know that? If I see an incoming SIN and I answer with a SIN ACK, you should be sending me back an ACK, right? But sometimes you don't. You go, well, hang on. If I got the SIN, why can't I get the ACK? And the answer is... You're filtering V6. You don't like my answer. So you think you have V6. You send me a sin. I send you an answer. You go, no, no, no. My firewall says evil. I'm not going to let that through. And the connection just dies. How prevalent is this? If you're running six to four, 20% of all connections fail. If you're stupid enough to still be running Teredo, you have my sympathy because one third of the time connection attempts fail. Stop it. Why do you hate yourself and your life? I'm like, Teredo is just junk and folk who run Teredo relays should be quietly taken out the back. Mr. Hurricane Electric here. Taken out the back and got rid of. Um, they're not doing anyone any, any help. What about normal non Teredo, non six to four? Well, again, I'm gonna pick on Telstra. Because this is kind of interesting. Because up until, geez, July last year, folk who were doing V6 were doing it as overlays. This doesn't tell you the number of samples, but it tells you the failure rate. Everyone who was using tunnels was doing around a 10% failure rate. So they had six sometimes. When Telstra turned on their service, all of a sudden, the failure rate bottomed right out. Brilliant. And the initial adopters had filters that worked. Slight hiccup around Christmas, someone took their eye off the ball. The little worker bees got back to work after the Christmas break, the network worked again. Over here is interesting the last few months because Telstra started to increase the volume. More and more folk have picked up on the service and I think we're encountering more firewalls and filters. As the stuff has moved out from experimental adoption, I know what I'm doing, to, oh my God, it just got turned on, you know, the firewall rules took over. This is not a bad rate, 2%, 1 to 2% is not a bad rate. This is, the world averages around 2. So I don't want to pick on them, but what it does show, it can show for your network too. This stuff comes out, these reports, for every major AS every day. And if you're running V6, you might find these reports to be incredibly useful. 
Because if you correlate what you know you did with what I'm seeing your users are experiencing, you have a far deeper insight than you could ever possibly obtain from just looking at your network. Because this looks at what users do across your network. Um, so these standing reports come out every single day, V6 deployment, V6 performance, globally, per country, per region, per network, as far down as you want to drill, they're there. Who's doing DNSSEC? Who turned it on? Who turned it off? Thank you, BNSL. Turn it back on, please. Uh, who supports ECDSA cryptography? For Christ's sake, support it. It's really good. We're sick of RSA. Um, all these reports come out again with as much granularity as you want. And you can certainly, if you're running a network, see yourself in all of its glory. Here are some graphs. They're all very pretty. Um, evidently, the marketing folk in, Telstra, in, in AP Nick love colours. Marketing folk in Telstra probably love it too. So evidently, colours are very sexy. These have colours. Cool. Um, we also do other things because, again, it's a very rich vein of information. I talked a little bit about shadowing. Who's looking at you? Is there a concentration of folk who look over your shoulder? Do they leave a fingerprint? Because everything we do, I should see once. If I see it twice coming from a different part of the world, how did that person know what you did? Because I didn't tell them. And if I didn't tell them, Something leaked. Who's leaking and why is a fascinating question. There is a lot of it. And we've certainly done some presentations in the past about this. Uh, scary but true. Um, why is the DNS garbage? I, I time things, so I should only ever see the query once. Some queries are three years old. The DNS never forgets. People haven't actually understood it yet, but it's the world's biggest storage system. Just ask a question, and the DNS will remember the question and keep on asking you regularly for months, for years. Around 40% of all the queries that a DNS server ever gets aren't real. They're echoes of what people did up to years ago. Why do you need bigger DNS servers? To cope with the junk, not to cope with reality. Oops. Um, one we did very recently, really bad news. Um, who can cope with fragmented uh, UDP in V6? In fact, who can cope with fragments in V6? Uh, you should be very worried. Around 30% of folk live behind DNS resolvers that do not handle extension headers in V6, including Google's public DNS, which I regard as being incredibly bad. If you can't fragment, the protocol starts to get pretty useless pretty quickly. 20% of users sit behind barriers that won't let them receive fragmented V6 at all. 20% of V6 users can't get fragmented V6, can't get extension headers. Oops. You've really got some work to do if you're going to take a V6 network seriously. If you can't fragment, it doesn't work. If you can't fragment, it doesn't work. So you should be really interested in those kinds of reports and in that data because that's the reason, if you will, you've got to fix that to make V6 real. So here are a few slide packs that I've done. You can sort of look at them. They're all through the, my archives and APNIX. It's time taken to do resolution. Who's doing stalking, storing in the totally deranged DNS queries? Uh, the folk who watch your every single URL, uh, RTT differences, etc. It's all out there. I field a fair few questions from time to time about this, and I'll just go through a, a few. Um, why does my economy have more ad samples than their economy? And, and the answer is Google. Google sort of tend to place my ad in, in some places and not others. I can't control that. Google are a law unto themselves. I can adjust it ever so slightly, but no. And Google's ads change over time. Because I'm bidding for your eyeballs, and sometimes Geordie likes your eyeballs too, and I lose. And so other ad advertisers change. So the system is incredibly dynamic. We don't do the same measurements every day. We just do a lot of them. Um, why does my network see the same thing? I see deeply into networks that have users that watch YouTube. I don't see deeply into work networks unless the worker bees like watching YouTube. There are a lot of worker places like that, who knows? But you know, sometimes I see deeply, but for small networks, no, I don't have the same degree of vision because I need lots of samples. Um, we do track it though. 
and we spend a lot of time understanding where Google places ads. At this particular point, if you look hard and it's in front of your screen, you'll see that India in June became the flavour du jour of Google's ads, and all of a sudden we were doing five million ads a day just in India alone. By God, we saw a lot of Geo, because Geo had just rolled out V6 and it was really clear. Other countries where you'd think you'd do a lot of ads, we don't do as much. But as you see, it varies day by day, so it's always interesting. Um, we also estimate the number of users you have, because we can. Because we know how many users are in the country, we know the proportion of ads that went to your network, simple mathematics takes over, we can make a stab at this. It's not real, it is a guess, it's a rough guess, but it's not stupid. So that when you say Comcast has, ooh, 50 million plus or minus 10 million subscribers, I'm not that far wrong. You know, it's not accurate to the individual, but it's not that far wrong. And it's this kind of insight as to how big are you compared to your competitors has certainly been of interest to some as well. Don't forget, I'm not counting the Internet of Things, I'm counting eyeballs, I'm counting the folk that matter, the folk that pay money, the folk that receive ads, the folk who are of intense interest to Google and, oddly enough, intense interest to me as well. Um, this might sound incredibly intrusive. Probably right, it does sound incredibly intrusive. Um, we do take this seriously. We're in an extremely privileged position. Not that we are different from any other advertiser, but we do say the, the data that we collect stays with us and doesn't go out further. We don't divulge individual IP addresses gathered in this measurement. We only report aggregates. We take this very, very seriously. So we're certainly not in the business of letting other people see inside our data sets. We will never do that. That is not part of our job. That will not happen. Um, can I stop you measuring me? Google is on again and off again. At one point, Google said, you must have a cookie. And we said, absolutely. If you don't want to be measured, we'll give you a cookie way of doing it. And then Google said, cookies are evil. Do not have cookies. OK, Google. So currently, I can't stop measuring you. I can't set up a cookie that blocks the measurement. Oddly enough, I'd like to. A, it's ethically sound, and B, it actually helps us with duplicates. But I can't do it yet. Uh, and I'd dearly like Google to think about it. There is a huge tension in, in advertising. Because if you're evil and you want to inject code on other people's machines, ads will do it unless the advertiser is very careful about vetting the ad and what the ad does. And so ads are always constrained and cookies were seen as a leak. Cookies are no longer in ads. Fair enough. Uh, if you're running an ad blocker, I won't count you. Sad face. If you're running an ad blocker just fine, they annoy the hell out of you, I, I don't care either. But an ad blocker, I won't measure you because you're running an ad blocker. Um, lots of people have helped with this project over the years and I'm incredibly grateful to Vint Cerf at Google who has been an absolutely stalwart supporter right from the word go and Warren Kamari. When things are broken because Google changed things, they have been absolutely unstinting in their generosity in fixing it. So they support me, still do support me with the ad systems every single day. And to both Vint and Warren, you know, undying thanks. Brilliant stuff. Uh, ICANN has been incredibly supportive as well, uh, particularly right into the DNS and DNSSEC capabilities. And these days, the office of the CTO, David Conrad's group, Elaine is here. If you see him, thank him for me, because, you know, again, just great support. Uh, the folk who give us bind, ISC, have been grateful with the server for years, uh, and that's really good. And there's a guy working for them who I have to say is the most outstanding hacker in the DNS I've ever come across. Ray Bellis developed our DNS server and my God, what an implementation. This stuff just leaps over tall buildings. Um, it allows us to dial a size, dial a behavior, anything you want, you program into the query and this magic piece of server library stuff just, you know, follows the instruction. It's brilliant. So all of those folk have been incredibly helpful in doing this. It's not just the team at APNIC. And as well, I must thank uh, George and Joao, and in the background, of course, Byron. We've been working on this for a long time, and it continues to be the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you. OK, so um, we'll 
you make sure that you have 10, 15 minutes at the end uh, from your coffee break, of course, uh, to have a Q&A session. So without further ado, uh, Jordi Pellet, he's gonna discuss the BCOP on IPv6 assignment. So here it is. Thank you. I usually do this presentation in 30 minutes and I have been told I have only uh, 15, so grab me in the, in the breaks if I go too fast. Um, okay, uh, what is this about? Well, uh, this is a, a group of people from different regions uh, which get together and decided to write uh, best current operational practices on how uh, number uh, the networks uh, so ISPs that don't have the experience yet can, can have some kind of guidelines because yes there are a lot of documents from ITF but well at the end not necessarily you are deploying the way that ITF is, is suggesting so there are different possibilities that come come out from the from the actual experience right so we started uh, almost uh, one year and a half ago. We had in the last uh, RIPE meeting, uh, I think it was last May, uh, our version two, and right now uh, we are in version seven, which is already running the last call. So we really believe that this document is now, uh, even if it's work in progress, is now uh, stable and will go through the, the last call and maybe we change uh, something uh, related to, to the, the, the grammar in the document because most of us are not native English speakers, but the contents are really stable. Um, I am not going through the, the table of contents. You can see later on the, the slides. Um, the document basically is 10 pages plus one page for the table of contents and one page for the executive summary. Uh, let me go through this executive summary. So if you want to stop here, you just run away. Otherwise, you keep reading the rest of the document. Uh, basically, the, the, the point here is that uh, when you design your IPv6 network, if you really don't take care in advance about um, looking at uh, all, all the details, uh, you are going to take decisions that may impact in the future uh, um, your, your deployment. So, so you really need to take care about uh, those things. Um, the first consideration is IPv6 is not the same as IPv4. If you really try to follow your rules for IPv4 for deploying IPv6, you are for sure making it wrong. Um, I usually, when I do IPv6 trainings, I usually say you need to forget or unlearn IPv4 before you start designing your IPv6 network. I think that's, that's really uh, uh, key. Um, in IPv6, you assign a short prefix to each uh, end customer site, so they are able to have many subnets. Uh, which are uh, by default of a length of 64 bits. Okay, so that's that's the key point. Um, the second recommendation we have in this executive summary is strongly discouraging to assign prefixes longer than slash 56. If you want a simple addressing plan, our recommendation is slash 48 for every customer. Never mind it's a residential customer, never mind it's a business customer, just give all of them the same, which is a slash 48, okay? Third recommendation, in order to facilitate troubleshooting and have a very, very proof uh, uh, network, you should consider numbering the one links uh, using global unicast addresses. There are different possibilities. I am going to discuss uh, about all them in the next slides, but we really believe that the best way is global unicast addresses. And the last one, uh, we have here a concept uh, because the people, when the people talk about um, uh, static addresses, dy dynamic addresses, that, that becomes very confusing. So. We decided to, to look for a new uh, terminology that applies to, to all the cases, and basically we decided to go for persistent versus non-persistent. So we are not looking here about how you actually provision the addresses to the customers. If you use manual provisioning or you use a special system developed in-house or you use DHCP, but what we are really looking is, is the same customer getting the same prefix? that means it's persistent. 
If not, it's non-persistent. Okay, so that makes much easier to, in regardless of the technology, decide uh, which one of the sides you are. Okay, so what we believe is that non-persistent prefixes are harmful uh, in IPv6, and you will have a lot of issues that better you need to avoid. Right? Uh, for example, power at out edges. Um, means that basically the customer will get problems every time get uh, get a problem with the power right let's let's see that in the next slides um well i don't think i need to spend a lot of time explaining what's a uh, big up i think i already mentioned basically it's best current operation practices and avoid getting your network uh, your ipv6 network broken so which that will mean that some content providers actually will filter your ipv6 if your network is perf performing badly um so you 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 better don't don't go for that also, um, one interesting thing is that in the next years, we are going to see uh, HomeNet deployed. HomeNet is uh, ways to automatically have some new features in, in the customer networks, in the residential networks, basically. But that applies also to, to small offices, medium enterprises, uh, typically, which means they may have one main router connecting to one or several ISPs, which one or several links that don't necessarily mean uh, uh, managing BGP or anything like that. There is a new, let's say, s automatic routing protocol that allows this home net router to, to, to be smart enough to decide what to do and have um, routers behind it uh, in, in a way that they are cascaded. So, for example, the, the router uh, connecting to the CP can get a slash 48, and the rest of the routers will get each of one uh, uh, a slash 56, okay, to, to connect different parts of your network or, or things like that. So, um, well, if you design incorrectly your network, that means it's possibly not going to work with HomeNet. So, so that's part of the considerations we are taking here. So, Size of the end customer prefix. Well, typically, many uh, recommendations uh, say go for slash 48 for enterprise, slash 56 for, for the rest. But many people is doing slash 60 or slash 64. Well, the point here is make sure to change your mind. This is not IPv4. We have enough addresses. Um, we have designed it IPv6 in a totally different way and not uh, to assign addresses but to assign prefixes. Okay, so that's that's the key point here. There were some maths a few years ago. Uh, there are different ways to do that, but basically if you count the population in the earth and uh, you start assigning a slash 48 for everyone, you will get uh, the life of IPv6 for almost 500 years and you can do that several times. Do you really believe IPv6 uh, will be our protocol in the next, I'm not talking about 500 years, in the next 100 years we will have new needs that will probably ask, uh, mandate us to design new protocols, but not because the lack of addresses, we will have different, different situations. So key thing, never do that, never assign a customer slash 64. I am not talking here about cellular networks, okay? That's a different case. There is a special consideration in the document for that. But in general, don't assign a single slash 64 to a customer. Never. No way. Broken. Very bad for you and very bad for your customers. I think it's, it's clear enough. So that's a real golden rule. Don't do just a slash 64 for a customer. Whatever you do, multiple, multiple number of slash 64s. Again, our recommendation is slash 48. Now, numbering the, the one link. Well, there are different possibilities. Let's go to, to, to each one of them. Uh, the first one is slash 64 from the customer prefix. I have another presentation after the break, and you will understand that this is really becoming interesting because more and more people is doing that. Basically, what it means is that if you allocate a slash 48 to the customer, you could use for the one link 
the first slash 64. And then you have the CPEs supporting uh, the, the basic requirements for the CPEs already mandate supporting uh, um, a ref, an, the RFC uh, 6603, which means that from the DHCP v6 allocated prefix by means of prefix delegation, you can exclude one of the slash 64s or even several of them out of the uh, slash 48. Okay, so that's something that it can be automatically managed by the network and simplifies your routing and, and get, get your network much simple. An alternative. This is what we do in IPv4. You have a dedicated pool for the one links. Okay, so I am not going to stop here because basically it's the same that we do in IPv4. Just uh, again, there are documents that recommend to do a slash 127. We believe that the best is a slash 64. And if you don't believe that, you can at least uh, reserve a slash 64 and use only a slash 127. Okay, that's a middle way. And number it means using link local addresses. Well, it's not really working for all the devices. It's complicated for troubleshooting. Uh, it not necessarily will work well with CPEs. CPEs can get confused when they r really need to access the network. So uh, again, we, we don't believe this is the best way. We have uh, also found another situation, which is that some hardware some uh, um, BNGs, uh, and we believe that's, that's a, a problem of implementation, actually recommend and number it, because if they use numbered links, their performance is lower. That's a vendor-specific problem, okay? So we, you should tell your vendor, hey, uh, I need the same performance regardless I am using number or unnumber it, right? Another alternative, ULS, uh, unique local uh, addresses, we strongly discourage that. Um, basically, if you are doing ICMPv6 from the CP to outside uh, of the ISP, you are lost. Okay, so again, not, not going to stand here, but it's not recommended. Um, so as a kind of summary for the for the point-to-point -point links, for the one links, uh, Slash 64 global unicast addresses is the recommended thing. And if you uh, are using CPs that support uh, RFC 6603, you can use uh, one uh, slash 64 from the customer prefix. Okay. Um, remember one thing is that if you use instead of a slash 64, a slash 127, and you need some kind of point to multi multipoint links, that will not work. Or if you need to inject some kind of managed bridges in that point-to-point -point link or some other devices for monitoring or whatever, they will not work because they will have no, 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 no chances to get numbered. Okay, so that's, that's one more thing here. Now, prefix assignment options. Important thing here is make sure to align it to, to a nibble boundary, okay? So it matches easily with, with DNS uh, reverse uh, delegations. Um, a single customer network, I already mentioned before, is a slash 64. So um, a single um, a slash 64 is not going to work. And here we have the same recommendation from ITF. Don't do just a single slash 64 for a customer. Okay, so minimum is multiples of them. So what I mentioned before, typical recommendation is a slash 48 for business, a slash 56 for residentials. There are some operators that do this. If you come back later to my presentation, you will discover how many, what is the proportion of, of uh, operators that do one or the other. Um, there are more and more advanced users that will not really like to have a slash 56. There are different reasons for that. Uh, for example, people may be using today tunnel brokers, they get a slash 48, or they are using transition mechanisms like 624, even we don't like anymore 624, but people is still using that or have been using that. They made their 
uh, numbering plants inside the home, which is slash 48, and now you give them a slash 56. They are broken. They need to redo that, okay? So it's not good. Uh, or maybe they still keep the, the tunnel broker as a backup. So what they do? They have different numbering plans depending on how they are connecting. Well, this, this is not optimal, right? Um, if you want to be conservative, maybe reserve a slash 48 for every customer and at the moment assign only the slash 56. That's, that's a possibility. So you can extend that later on. If you really believe you will have problems with the prefix you got, probably you did the wrong numbering plan and probably you got the wrong prefix from your registry. So come back to APNIC and tell APNIC, hey, this is my numbering plan. I want to sign a slash 48 policies allow that, so give me a bigger prefix. That's it, so simple. So this is the, the approach that we suggest. Uh, it's the easier one. Uh, it is the one that allows you to have the same numbering plan for all your customers, that the, independently of the, they are residential or, or business. So just go for that. One more thing here I, I forgot before is that slash 48 is also the ULA prefix size. So if you are using HomeNet or you are using other technologies or you, by the way, which I don't recommend, but you are using ULA inside your network, also match the, the, the size of the ULA. Okay, So that's one more reason to use slash 48. Whatever you do, we don't recommend at all to use something uh, smaller than slash 56. Okay, So if you count how many slash 56 you have in a slash 32 or a slash 29. Uh, slash 29 is the default allocation uh, for ISPs in RIPE. In the rest of the regions, it's a slash 32. For that reason, we did the two numbers. But you, you have 134 millions or 16 millions of, of possibilities. So it's not really a problem to, at minimum, go for a slash 56, even if we still recommend a slash 48. Well, there is, there is something I forgot here. Let me, if I can go back, yeah. Um, we believe that, uh, and there is a special uh, recommendation in the document, uh, and this is the way it's done. In cellular networks, by default, it's a slash uh, 64 for every PDP context. Again, I have a presentation after tomorrow about uh, IPv6 in mobile, so I will explain that, but if you are actually connecting broadband users which, uh, for example, an LTE modem, they are not anymore to be considered cellular. They are broadband users, so they should get also, also slash uh, 48, okay? Now, what I have explained very quickly at the beginning, persistent versus non-persistent. Non uh, the idea here is, are you always giving the customer the same prefix every time he connects again? Typically, broadband customers today don't, never disconnect, right? But if for whatever reason they disconnect, uh, maybe after one hour you give them a different prefix, or after one day, or after three days, so that will be non-persistent, okay? But if you give them the same even if they disconnect for three months, that's persistent, that's the thing. How you do that is, is not dependent on, on what we are defining here. So you can do that automatically, or you can have a DHCP v6 prefix delegation tied to a, an authentication ser server or things like that. OK, so that's not the point. The point is uh, what we recommend, persistent or non-persistent. It's true that non-persistent seems like much easier. And this is the way that typically we do today in IPv4. But the problem is that even if looks like easier to do, problems come later. Um, we are not looking here at customer portability in the sense that if a customer decides to move from one city to another, you keep the same prefix. That's a different situation. If you want to offer that service, that means injecting a, a route in your a routing, uh, internal routing. So probably you should uh, either don't allow that or charge the customer for that. Like. Uh, uh, the cellular numbers portability or something like that. Unless regulators come in, we don't expect that to happen, okay? So if you stay in the same, let's say, aggregation, BNG or whatever, well, you can keep the, the same prefix, but otherwise, we don't expect that. 
Most of the time, the people is using the SCPv6 prefix delegation. That's also a recommended uh, preference. Um, and it means you can tie that system to a AAA to allow that persistence. Why non-persistence is harmful? Well, there is a very simple example here. If there is a power outage, um, the CPE, most of the time, we found only one brand in the market that do that, but most of the time the CPE will not send a prefix valid lifetime equal to zero. So that means that the devices in the customer network, like laptops or tablets or cellular phones that are connected to the wireless or Ethernet network, will remember the prefix that they had before. So even if the router boots up again with a new prefix, they will still try to connect with the previous prefix. And of course, it will not work. And even if you have a new power outage, it means it will have a third prefix and so on. So every time there is a power outage until those prefixes die, uh, you will have more and more uh, chances to, to have the connection broken, which means calls to the uh, your support center, right? So it means spending money. Also, another uh, question here is, if you use persistent prefixes, you know in advance every customer which prefix is using, because it's in your AAA system, so you don't need to lock all the connections. If you use non-persistent prefixes, means extra cost of logging all the connections, or every uh, Traffic change, let's say. So you can save some money here as well. Um, in addition to that, having persistent prefixes means you can offer new services. For example, you can offer uh, extra services related to DNS. If a customer wants to have customer1.username.isp9.com, you can do that easily. You could do that with non-persistent prefixes, but it will be a more complex system to develop and to, to maintain. So think also in business possibilities about that and additional services that you can offer by means of that. Okay? And that's it. I'm not sure how much time I did. It was really, really fast. <laughs> I did the 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So quickly, uh, I would like to call upon Sunny and Jeff to be on stage for the quick Q&A. So the floor is open. If you want to ask any question, please go ahead. Yep. You have questions on Jebba? Yes. Oh, Adobe Connect, not Jebba. So the first question, Sunny. This is to Sunny, I think. Some smartphones, even though bought recently, do not seem to support V6. So how has Telstra overcome that? The question is not so clear, but that's what it says. Some smartphones, even though very new and recently bought, do not seem to do V6. Well, uh, what kind of phones? <clears throat> that's a strange one. Yeah, that's a strange but the, the, problem is, the problem is that there are a lot of manufacturers that release handsets that still don't support IPv6 today for some reason. They've turned it off, right? And I'm talking about the really cheap devices, right? But those are the same handsets that are being manufactured to go to India, which is a huge IPv6 potential market. So the question is... Oh, it's probably 2G, yes. So, so the question has to go, go back to the vendor. What, what's going on here? Okay. Okay, Sunny again, second question for you. In your network, in Telstra's V6 deployment in mobile networks, is your prefix assignment for end devices slash 64 or is it something bigger? It's a slash 64. Uh, unfortunately, that is defined by standards and, and vendors. Uh, until we have this DHCP prefix delegation available, this is no other option. You? DHCP. Prefix PD. delegation? Yeah, prefix. Really? You're going to get that on Android? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's optional for some vendors at the moment, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's part of 3GPP release 10. So, I, I have used that in uh, broadband modems, LTE modems, but usually in cellular phones, you don't need anything else, so, so it doesn't make sense. But 
definitely is part of the standards using the HTTP 6 PD, but of course it's not implemented in server forms because it don't make sense. But the different thing is broadband modems. So, oh yeah, uh, this is for Jordi. Uh, this is a question from Fiji, uh, Visharat. Uh, uh, just, uh, can you also, uh, what's the name of the person yes, who's asking? Yes, so Visharat from Fiji okay. has this question for Jordi. Um, BCOP of uh, minimum, the, sm the smaller prefixes that the, the smaller prefixes that you are recommending, either a slash 56 or slash 48 out, he's saying ISPs get only slash 32s, what he, if he runs out of his slash 32 block, uh, because that's even if, yeah. I think, I that's wrong, that's, that's wrong. You should not get just a slash 32 before going to APNIC or whatever registry, you should make your numbering plan and make sure how much you need and then you apply to APNIC and they will give you what you prove that you need. That's simple. If you already get your, your last 32, you have to redo your numbering plan according to your needs and come back to APNIC to get the subsequent allocation, right? But that's perfectly possible. I am sure that if there is a hostmaster here, we'll confirm that I am right. There is not any problem with the policy uh, to allow that, except maybe in very big cases, which that's the reason I submitted the policy proposal. But for a normal ISP, there is not a problem. Okay, so we have uh, Brijesh on the mic. Um, <coughs> Brijesh Jain, <coughs> question for Jordi. Uh, you suggested slash 48 and you said 450 years or something in the human population. What about IOTs? If, uh, if with IOT also, <coughs> Uh, same allocation is to be done? Well, uh, IOTs are connected to some network that already got the slash 48, right? No, IOT device. Yes. Uh, allocation, IOT device also is... And a, a device gets a slash 1 to 8. A device. So if, if a device is getting a slash 1 to 8, which is a single address, and you got for that network containing many devices a slash 48, you don't have a problem, okay? okay? So I am talking about networks, not individual devices. Even in ITF right now, we have a discussion, which is in the last call, for allocating devices a slash 64. But that is meant, for example, if those devices are running virtual machines, and it means that they need multiple addresses because every device is using or is having virtual machines inside. But in EOT, I don't think you need to go to that. Thanks. This is a question that's been around for about 12, 13 years because originally the advice coming out from the ITF was everything gets a slash 48. And when we looked at the numbers, that was basically insane advice. Uh, we could expect around 10, 15 years of life out of V6 and then there'd be another piece of aggress crunch coming. The reason why we moved away from the HD ratio, the reason why we moved away from a fixed size slash 48 was that, quite frankly, there's an awful lot of machinery to come. Slash 48s won't do it. I actually really worry about the 64-bit boundary and I think it's actually way too big. This idea that Slack needs 64 bits is a piece of mythology invented by folk that truly don't understand scaling. And that, you know, I, I have really big problems with the address plan as it stands today, but that's just me. Geordie seems to think it'll last for years. I disagree. I reckon about 50 years tops. Thanks. Okay. It's, it's not just me. It's, 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 it's a big op for a lot of people. It has got this cassette in, in right community. It's a lot of people thinking that, but I, 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 I've had this discussion several times with Jeff, and yeah, it, it depends on how you do the maths, but that's it. I'll, 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 look, I'll just add two cents here, because um, slash 64 for a UE, it's ridiculous. It's insane. It's insane. Why, why do I need it? I need a 128. So, you know, unfortunately, there's no option for me, because I'm just following standards. 
So the B Corp uh, document will remain open for a very well, longer all, time. All, all this came out not because of the B Corp. I think that was largely irrelevant. What actually happened was in the ITF they decided to standardise, make a full standard of the proposed V6 standards. And all of a sudden all these little bits of stuff that doesn't quite work, that isn't well specified, came out of the woodwork. And when you start looking at this with an obsessive compulsive eye, then all of a sudden a lot of V6 has little bits that just don't interlock cleanly. And, and that offends folk, me included. It's just bizarre. The whole idea of 8 plus 8, which died centuries ago, is enshrined in a 64-bit boundary. So you're not just burning half the address space. You're taking away 64 bits, which is 2 to the 64. This is enormous. So all of a sudden, we thought we we're running out of V4 addresses. Let's go to a really big V6 base. Wow, it's so big, let's waste it all. And it's kind of human behaviour at its worst. This is really bad behaviour, and we will live to regret it when the V6 address crunch comes. And for many years, uh, we were told that it's fine to be wasteful in V6. And now we are discussing the same thing again. Then don't be wasteful. I can in V6. pull 48 bits out of a V4 NAT. Why do you need V6? If the whole idea was to give you a certain amount of breathing space and you've now limited the amount of oxygen you're getting to the same amount of oxygen that you're going to get on V4 on NATs, why do I go to a protocol that doesn't fragment? Why do I go to a protocol whose IP, ICMP treatment is really quite broken? Where's the advantage if you've thrown away all the large address space that was really the killer point. And that's the big debate in the IETF. Do we standardise this and sort of ignore the wrinkles? Because, you know, V6 is good for us. Or do we try and make it work for centuries? But centuries in this world, where in the last 20 years you've gone from three pippings on the internet to 30 billion, what does centuries really mean in the silicon world? You have no idea and neither do I, and neither do the V6 folk. This is a worry. So in 20 years, at least, we have a standardized IPv6. So let's see how it goes. Well, but like I said, there's a lot of it, the standards are not very well done, and there's a lot of bits that don't just interlock well, and that's a problem. It is. Okay, so let's move back to uh, the floor. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Aaron. Um, my question is still about uh, uh, IPv6 prefix assignment. I still know some technical people who claims that it is sufficient to assign a slash 64 to a home network. Uh, I try to tell them that uh, we, we got lots of IP address here, uh, but they say, oh, you have many address now. It doesn't mean that you can waste it in that way. So can we describe a clear scenario that we can easily convince them that assigning a slash 64 is a really bad idea? A clear scenario. If, Thank you. If they read actual standards, it's against the standards. Another thing is if, if Jeff wins and we change the standards. But right now, the standards say by default, which is lack, which means ah. automatic uh, address assignment, the devices will need LANs, which is LAS64. So it means you have a guest SSID, and you have a single LAS64, and you don't want to breach them, you need an additional 64 for the guest SSID. So that's a very, very simple example. Let's have the user network and a guest network, which a single slash 64 doesn't work. Let me quibble, because Slack didn't define a 64 as the standard. People implemented it that way. You can run Slack off 63, 62, or 61. The problem is you're never going to find an implementation. So in some ways, common practice, rather than standards, has introduced this slash 64. And then because we all like plug and play, because obviously it's brilliant, yes, and, and somehow DHCP and Slack is what's required to get DNS working, oh my God, then in that morass, a slash 64 seems to have a better survival chance than any other bit size. That's what we're saying. Which if you think that's an unsatisfactory answer, so do I. But you know, that's at the heart of this. Again, the specs were not done well. 
Not really. Slack didn't demand it. It's convenient and implementation support. Yeah, but we have decided to use EI64 or some magical way of deciding the 64-bit part of the end host, and it works. And because this is the implementation because, available yeah, today. multicast just works. Yeah, exactly. right. Exactly. <laughs> so next question. Hello. Uh, I'm Fahad Khan from uh, Pakistan Cybernet. I just uh, need a recommendation. Uh, uh, what would be the best practice uh, implementing IPv6 addressing scheme on the BGP or the PPPoE, the links, uh, the customers? Would it be the same as giving the, uh, the same IP addressing scheme or would it be a little bit different regarding that? There are two schools of thought and they are both almost religious. One is a link is a slash 64. Now, people say you can play ping pong because each side thinks all the default addresses in that sublink are on the other side, this is a disaster. On the other hand, other things just work because it's a slash 64. Other folks say slash 126s, you know, or even 127s. Give them a unique address all the way down the bottom, don't waste the bits, it's not worth it, and it actually makes security just that little bit easier because the link only has two addresses, there's no ping pong you can play with it. Don't forget too, just bear in mind, the poor hardware vendor. Their ASICs do the lookup on all 128 bits. 128 bits aren't any slower than 64 bits that are significant. You can run 128 bit at the same forwarding speed. So, you know, I camp out on the 128 bit side of things, but I appreciate other folk think 64s are simpler in, in your routes. Your call, whatever you feel you can live with. As I mentioned in the presentation, one possibility is slash 64 reserved, but used at the moment only one to seven. It's true that it, there was this ping pong thing, which happened already before in IPv4, but it was a bad implementation, okay? If, if it's well implemented, it should not happen. And having a slash 64 gives you the opportunity to have, for example, managed bridges or whatever in the middle of that point to point link, that otherwise you cannot number. Um, I hate wasting IP addresses for IPv6. <laughs> once bitten. Yep, once bitten. So all my interconnections are slash 127. Just to keep things simple. And then there is a subgroup on that <coughs> 127 uh, school of thought is allocate slash 64 but assign slash 127, but then what's the point of that? It's you're still wasting a long bit. Yeah, yeah. but you can use that slash 64 space for multiple slash 127s, not one one slash 27. So, so you reserve a slash 64 oh per customer. Oh dear, right? oh dear. So you reserve a slash 64 per customer, then you assign it. Yeah, yeah. So you still, still in that, it's, it's because what I just mentioned. And this is our recommendation. If you don't want to go to the full slash 64, reserve slash 64, but use slash 127. If tomorrow you need devices in the middle that need to be managed, but you the, have the number of space and you, didn't, you don't need to renumber The problem again. with that, if tomorrow you leave the company, the second person who joins in will say, what a rubbish that, that he did, right? So the thing is, it's, it's, it's still, it's, for me, BCOB is, is, will remain open forever because this, 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 this discussion is very religious rather than technical. Whoever thought address plans were boring? Yes. <laughs> and whoever thought like IPv6 discussion is going to be boring? Yes. So, well, I had nightmares after attending the IoT discussion. 
So I'm not sure how many of you are going to have nightmares after attending this discussion that you still don't know how to plan your IPv6 deployment. So, but thank you so much for our panelists that uh, I hope everyone got some good information. So a big round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. Now you can have your tea break you. or coffee break. <laughs>